Good afternoon. We are delighted to have you all with us during this very important event, the next wave, how to prevent and beat future pandemics. With experts joining us here today from all over the world, we will take a deep dive into COVID's impact on the world's health systems, societies, and economies, as well as the necessary actions needed to fight current and future pandemics. During this journey, we will spotlight the undeniable link between human and animal health, explore ways to strengthen the resilience of health systems in the face of future pandemics, and reflect on the role of the international community in ensuring an equitable access to health services. Welcome, and I hope that you will enjoy today's discussion and it will be beneficial and inspiring to prevent future pandemics. Well, have you ever thought about the origin of any infection? How did it start? How it was transmitted? And how it became an outbreak or epidemic or pandemic and maybe later on endemic in certain parts of the world. To kick off today's discussions, we'll go back to the origins, examining the nexus of human and environmental interactions involved in the emergence of zoonosis. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Cunningham, Deputy Director of Science at the Institute of Zoology, Zoological Society of London, and Dr. Neil Vora, Fellow at Conservation International. They will be joining us live today to share their remarks on the origins of outbreaks. Today, I'm talking about zoonotic pathogens and how they emerge to cause pandemics. Pathogens are things like bacteria and viruses that cause disease, while zoonotic pathogens are those that exist in non-human animals but have the ability to infect people, and when they do so, this is called spillover. Zoonotic diseases can emerge from virtually any animal species as all animals harbour a large range of pathogens and most of these will never be able to infect people who have their own range of pathogens by the way. And many pathogens lie hidden or dormant within their hosts for weeks, months or even years. Certain types of animal have been identified as being more likely than others to harbour pathogens with the ability to infect people. Such high-risk taxa include non-human primates, bats, and rodents. Primates mostly due to the evolutionary closeness to human beings. Bats and rodents mostly because of the vast numbers of species in these groups. The greater the number of species in a taxonomic group, such as bats and rodents, the more zoonotic or potentially zoonotic pathogens they're likely to be carried by that group. And since bats account for around 20% of mammals on Earth and rodents make up about 40% of, of all known mammals, the numbers game alone makes these taxa more likely than others to harbour zoonotic pathogens. So how do these pathogens jump from wildlife into people? For this to happen, Usually people have to get close to infected animals, their feces or body fluids, and those animals need to be excreting the pathogen to expose humans to it. People who are in close contact with these animals can be exposed to novel pathogens, creating the ideal circumstances for new diseases to emerge. When animals are stressed, such as through severe weather or food shortages, they become immunosuppressed and are therefore more likely to excrete pathogens, especially viruses. A prime example of people causing animals to become stressed and in an environment conducive to zoonotic spillover is live wildlife markets. Here, wild animals are taken from the wild, brought together from different habitats 
often transported over large distances and crammed together into cages. Between capture and slaughter, they are stressed and immunosuppressed, and so are increasingly likely to excrete whatever pathogens they have in them, while also being increasingly vulnerable to being infected by pathogens they don't naturally encounter. The presence of different wildlife species in such small areas exposes them to novel pathogens, and if a new species is successfully infected and becomes diseased, this facilitates zoonotic spillover. This is because when an animal becomes sick, it produces large amounts of the causative pathogen, which leads to the generation of pathogen mutants, and this further increases the likelihood of zoonotic spillover, as one or more of the mutants might be better adapted to infect people. This is particularly the case for RNA viruses which is a group of viruses that have high rates of genetic mutation and host adaptation. COVID-19, SARS, MERS, Ebola, Marburg, AIDS, Nipah and Hendra are all examples of recently emerged zoonotic diseases from wildlife that are caused by RNA viruses. While the COVID-19 pandemic has caused huge loss of life and economic loss, it has an estimated case of... Hello, are, am I still on? Andrew, we, I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. So, uh, okay, um, so while the COVID-19 pandemic has caused huge loss of life and economic loss, it has an estimated case fatality rate of only around 1%. While this represents a major threat to public health and well-being, our continued exploitation of the natural world exposes humanity to some much more dangerous um, diseases. Ebola, for example, kills around 50% of those infected, and Nipah virus around 60%, rising to 100% in some outbreaks. In Bangladesh, there is a new emergence of Nipah on an almost annual basis, and each time a human outbreak occurs, the virus is being given the chance to mutate and adapt to human beings and to become more readily transmitted amongst people. Around 260 viruses in mammals and birds are known to be zoonotic, yet it is estimated that in these hosts alone, there are around 700,000 viruses with zoonotic potential that have not yet been discovered. Each time zoonotic infection occurs, there is a chance that the virus will mutate to become better adapted to human-to-human -to -human transmission. It's a bit like playing Russian roulette with each spillover event being akin to pulling the trigger. While the identification of viruses with a propensity to spill over into people should inform ways to tackling future zoonotic emergence, we are not going to be able to develop vaccines or treatments for the hundreds of thousands of potentially zoonotic viruses that exist in wild animals. A more effective and efficient way of targeting resources would be to develop a risk-based method to prioritize mitigation measures and to target future research. So wild animals, just like humans, naturally carry a range of pathogens. And this pathogen complement is an important component of biodiversity. It is clear that human activities and behaviours increase the risks of and opportunities for zoonotic spillover. However, wild animals are not the problem. They don't cause disease emergence. People do. So what should we be doing to prevent the next pandemic? Well, that's the topic my colleague, Dr. Neil Vora, will talk about next. Thank you, Professor Cunningham. Uh, for that fantastic overview. So it's clear that emerging infectious diseases are on the rise, and most of these originate from animals. And if you were to review that list of emerging infectious diseases that Professor Cunningham just gave us, you would quickly come to the conclusion that many of these new infectious diseases are often of high consequence. So it begs the question, why are these infectious <coughs> diseases increasing over time? Why do we increasingly experience them? 
And that's because of the rise in human-animal interactions driven by human activities. And I would put those into three broad buckets. Number one is land use change, particularly in the form of tropical forest degradation and clearing. And a tragic example of that is with Nipah virus, as Professor Cunningham alluded to. Bucket number two is the trade, the, the, is the commercial wildlife trade, both legal and illegal. And a tragic example of that is with the emergence of monkey virus in the Midwest of the United States in the early 2000s. And bucket number three is because of poor biosecurity implementation during animal husbandry or raising of livestock and poultry. And tragic examples of that include with the emergence of influenza viruses. And so the bottom line is that, fortunately, if there's any silver lining to be found out of COVID, is that we are now talking about how do we as humanity do a better job with addressing pandemics going forward. To do so will require that we correct the failed approaches to pandemics that we have done in the past. And so reducing pandemic debts going forward requires that we implement better prevention, preparedness, and response for pandemics. Pandemic prevention means avoiding a pandemic in the first place. Pandemic preparedness means increasing our ability to respond if a pandemic occurs. And pandemic response is what we are doing right now in the midst of COVID, which is actually dealing with the pandemic once it is underway. Underinvesting in any one of these three areas will result in mismanagement of the next pandemic and the inability to save as many lives as possible. Unfortunately, even now, despite the, renewed, despite the discussions about doing a better job going forward, we often see that prevention is being sidelined, whereas preparedness and response are, are the two aspects that are being emphasized. Now, I'm not saying that preparedness and response are, are, um, are, are incorrect uses of, of, of resources. We absolutely need to invest more in preparedness and response for pandemics. That is critical for safeguarding human lives in the future, but that is insufficient if we really want to do the best job that we can for addressing pandemics. We also need to invest in pandemic prevention. Now, why are pandemic preparedness and response insufficient? Well, there's at least three reasons for that. Reason number one is that a future pathogen may emerge that will defy conventional public health and clinical wisdom. In the past decade alone, we have been surprised time and time again by infectious diseases from Ebola to Zika to now COVID. And there is another pathogen out there that is lurking in nature that once emerges in humans will surprise us. Reason number two is that no public health intervention is perfect. Just look at the failed responses to COVID in many countries of the world that have advanced public health systems. And reason number three is that we live in an age of misinformation and disinformation. For example, even in countries with unlimited vaccine supplies, those countries are not able to vaccinate enough of their population because of the spread of misinformation and disinformation. And that is an issue that is not going away anytime soon. So that is why we also need to invest in pandemic prevention alongside preparedness and response. So how do we invest in pandemic prevention? What exactly do we need to do? That requires that we stop deforestation so that we can decrease those chances of humans and wildlife interacting. Activity number two is that we need to invest in the health and economic security of communities living in emerging infectious disease hotspots of the world. Activity number three is that we need to end or strictly regulate wildlife trade and markets that pose public health risks. And activity number four is that we need to do a better job of implementing infection control for during animal husbandry. The, the, the return on investment of investing in these activities is massive. It'll cost around 10 to $20 billion a year to properly implement these activities, which is a drop in the bucket compared to the millions of lives and trillions of dollars that we've lost from a pandemic such as COVID. Now, how are we to implement these going forward? In the year 2022 and 2023, there are several, uh, there are several vehicles for, uh, through which we can move, push these activities forward. For example, there is a lot of discussion right now within the World Health Assembly about creating a new pandemic agreement, such as a pandemic treaty. It is, this is one ideal vehicle for us to then implement pandemic prevention as an international community. 
And another vehicle through which to implement these activities is through the creation of a new global fund for pandemics. There's a lot of talk right now for, to, to create a, a new fund similar to the global fund to fight TB, HIV, and malaria, but this one would be for pandemics. And it is critical that pandemic prevention be incorporated into such a fund if it is indeed created. As we proceed with any of these activities, we must always prioritize equity. The people least responsible for the destruction of nature are the people who are most susceptible to its adverse effects. So any of the solutions that we choose to implement must always bear in mind the, 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 the aspects of, of, of equity. And I would also argue that if we choose not to invest in prevention as an international community, it implies that the global community is tolerant of outbreaks continuing to occur in many of the most resource-limited settings of the world, so long as those outbreaks do not grow into epidemics and pandemics. And I, do, and I believe that most people would obviously disagree with, with, with such a vision of the world. And that is why, that is one reason why from an equity perspective, we must also invest in pandemic prevention. And so um, in, in, in closing, it is, it is clear that the health of humans is linked to the health of animals and the environment. And we need to think more holistically about our relationship with nature if we want to save lives human li if we want to save human lives going forward thank you very much and with that I'll end my remarks and and, and uh, turn it over to uh, questions and answers thank you dr vora and professor cunningham for joining us live and for sharing these key points with us i have a question for you dr neil you mentioned civic, civil, sorry, several mitigation actions that we can do to prevent future mm -hmm. pandemics. If you want to prioritize these actions, how, which one comes in the first place? Um, that's, a, that's a fantastic question because resources are limited, but the reality is, is that we have to invest in all four of those activities that I mentioned because if we underinvest in any one of those, we will continue to have that weak link. And again, a chain is only as strong as the weakest link. And so we need to invest in, in, in all of these activities. And, and again, when I talk about the cost of that, that's 10 to $20 billion a year. That sounds like a lot of money to an average person, but on the scale of, of the, the, the amount of wealth that passes through the world on a daily basis or, or internationally, this is really a drop in the bucket. Um, could, could I come in on that as well? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'd just like to reinforce what, what uh, Dr. Vora has said um, and to say that, you know, um, it's the way, it's the changes and the way we are interacting with nature that are leading to pandemics from emerging. Um, and the biggest driver of that is uh, habitat loss and biodiversity loss. Now, um, Often the drivers of zoonotic disease emergence are also the drivers of biodiversity loss and of climate change. Um, so on the upside, the actions to prevent pandemics will also help to mitigate biodiversity loss and to mitigate climate change. So, mm. you know, uh, the investment that Dr. Vora talked about while being um, uh, hugely beneficial to prevent pandemics will also help to mitigate climate change and, um, and biodiversity loss. So it's a win-win-win, it's a really. Yes, very interesting. Um, I can open the floor to a few questions to the speakers. Any questions? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Okay, it's working. Yes, yeah, so following the question that I was just asked, okay, let me just introduce myself first. So in Ajiva, I'm the Vice President for External Affairs of the International Federation of Medical Students Associations. Um, following this question, uh, I was wondering what is actually the role of international organizations such as the WHO to make sure that these measures are implemented across countries? And I also have another question, if that is okay, because even now during the WHO Executive Board meeting, when we were also discussing the, this future instrument and this future pandemic treaty, there were some discussions, of course, related to One Health, fortunately, and there were some views shared related to wildlife markets and it's being forbidden or being restricted. I was wondering what are also your views on that? 
Professor Cunningham, you want to take the first stab? Um, sure, thank you. Yes, so um, the, the organizations like the World Health Organization are, are really important in, uh, in ensuring that these measures for pandemic prevention are put in place. And in fact, the World Health Organization, along with the FAO, the World Organization for Animal Health and United Nations Environment Programme, have recently set up a, a One Health High Level Expert Panel to advise on exactly this and how they should be tackling this and to, um, to come up with recommendations um, for these IGOs and, and for government. Um, the second question was, I, for, I forgot what it was. It, it, it was about, um, I, I think about wildlife markets and trades and- Yes, and, oh, and, yes. Oh, yes. how yeah. would you make Thank sure you. that uh, it stopped? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the knee-jerk reaction, and, and it's, quite, uh, it, it's quite understandable why you should have this, is to just ban the hunting of, of wildlife and to ban these wildlife markets. Um, I don't think that's practical because it will drive a lot of this underground. There's already a lot of illegal wildlife trade and it will just become greater. And, and besides, a, a, a huge proportion of the population depend on wild meat um, for protein. Um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a matter of regulation, improving regulation. I think um, I would minimize the distance that animals um, are, are transported. I mean, we know very little about the uh, supply chains of wildlife markets. And, and I think there's a, there's a, a really important area to, to look into there. But um, preventing the mixing of different species, and that's wild species and domestic species. Um, not overstocking, not cramming these creatures into into lots of cage, in, into cages, but um, having them well looked after, high levels of animal welfare. I would only have live animal markets where live animals are absolutely critical to be there. I mean, animals should be slaughtered as, as quickly as possible after capture to help uh, minimise the sort of um, opportunities for um, pathogen mutation and human exposure to pathogens. Um, and a bit of education, people, as to uh, improving hygiene, improving biosecurity. Um, but, but generally, I think this is an area that's needing um, uh, uh, decent regulation. Yes. And, and I fully agree with, with everything Professor Cunningham just said. Um, and, and just to emphasize the point on, on equity here, because there are many people in the world, particularly indigenous peoples and local communities that will rely on wildlife for sustenance and yeah. for cultural reasons. Uh, but there's also a segment of society that consumes wildlife for luxury purposes, for, for not really for subsistence, but as, as, a, uh, uh, as a sign of wealth. And, and, and that is one aspect of the wildlife trade and markets that poses risk to public health, but is not really needed for, for human well-being. And, and that is something that, again, through proper investment of resources, we can do a better job of addressing going forward. Yes. Any questions? Yes. Hello. Could, could you make the question short and straightforward, please, to gain more time? And because we're left with one minute. Go okay. ahead, please. Uh, so mine is a statement more than a question. So, okay. Um, my name is Sadaf Lyons. I work with the International Association for National Public Health Institutes. And we work very closely with the WHO hub for integrated surveillance. And so the system that's been setting up now that they want to um, create is how do you integrate those systems around One Health, social determinants of health, into an integrated surveillance system that links national public health institutes with the laboratory systems, as well as with communities and communities of practice so that it would be easier to monitor and collect the data and analyze and make decisions which prevent pandemics, not only in terms of the control of pandemics as well. So I think that's really important to link it mm. into zoonotic diseases as well. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Any comment, Dr. Neil or Dr. Professor Andrew, before we sum up? I would just iterate that, that yes, improving surveillance is, is critical, but yeah. surveillance just detects a spillover after it's happened. And I think it's really important that we put a lot more investment 
into preventing the spillover from happening in the first place? Yes, prevention. Absolutely. Is key. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Surveillance is the backbone of public health, mm. but we also have to go further upstream to prevent these incidents in the first place. Yes. But I uh, fully agree. We need more integration. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Now, <laughs> I'm pleased to introduce our next session, Creating a Fit for Future System. The current COVID-19 pandemic has unraveled low levels of preparedness and fragile health systems that failed to absorb the high demand for health care worldwide. Actions should be taken on multiple levels to strengthen and build durable health systems able to face future outbreaks. To take a deep dive into this subject, I would like to welcome Mr. Aidan O'Leary, Director of Global Polio Eradication Initiative, and Dr. Sarthak Das, Chief Executive Officer of the Asia-Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance. Thank you for joining us live today, and welcome. Okay, first, Mr. O'Leary. Okay, I'm going to sit here. Okay. Mr. O'Leary, what lessons can you draw from the polio fight to combat outbreaks and future pandemics? Thanks, Ria. And uh, again, many thanks for the opportunity to participate in the session today. What I hope to do is to share maybe some experiences from the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, where we've been uh, moved from a situation where uh, a thousand children uh, per day were being paralyzed across 125 countries in the late 1980s to a situation where we've had just five children paralyzed in just two countries uh, during the course of 2021. I think there are five key lessons that I would or probably highlight and identify. The first is the importance of a, a planning and a coordination space uh, at all levels, from global down to the point where uh, programs are actually delivered. Uh, with are basically a number of key functions. Uh, firstly, the importance of identifying risk and assessing that risk. Secondly, is around the coordination of operational response. And the third is uh, around governance and accountability. And for the polio eradication program, emergency operation centers at all levels have been the key towards bringing together this planning, the coordination, the oversight, to really make sure that plans are delivered as planned and there is appropriate accountability at all levels for making sure that the appropriate priority focus and accountability is delivered. I think the second key lesson is around the importance of surveillance, which I think was highlighted by our previous speakers. But in this regard, I think it's important about being clear of surveillance standards and targets, what the expectations are, and constant monitoring against those targets. Secondly, I would highlight the importance of capacities, particularly laboratory capacities. And I would note in this regard that the GPEI draws upon 147 laboratories globally in order to ensure that our surveillance is effective and timely and sufficiently sensitive. I think the third point I would highlight within uh, surveillance is the importance of data analysis and collection really making sure that it is being brought together in a really timely way to inform decision making. And then last but not least, the importance of transparency, really making sure that those risks are identified, assessed, and the severity is fully understood by decision makers and more broadly. I think the third key lesson is on the area of the tools for intervention. So whether these are preventative tools, whether they're therapeutics, What's really important is the uh, really making sure they're available, they're safe, uh, they're effective, they're cheap, and they're easy to administer. And certainly for the polio eradication program, we've benefited from that. And I think what we've seen uh, in relation to the pandemic is the extraordinary steps taken over the last 12 to 18 months to also turn this into a reality. I think that the fourth lesson learned is in the area of delivery. And I would probably describe the polio eradication program as the ultimate equity program, because it's not just a question of reaching uh, the majorities in each of the countries, 
It's really uh, focusing on those that we traditionally miss, whether for grounds of inaccessibility, whether on grounds of just being persistently missed, or whether on the, the grounds of being part of marginalized communities. And I think this is an area where in order for the program to succeed, we really have to excel because there is simply no way to actually achieve eradication uh, unless we actually tackle those uh, zero dose children, those zero dose communities. And I think uh, as we're all aware, I think it is probably the key area where the pandemic response to date has struggled to really deliver on that equity argument. And then last but not least, I would focus on the importance of governance and accountability. And I would probably highlight this by simply saying that there are no technical solutions to a political problem. So whether that political problem is related to hesitancy, hostility, unwillingness, there's no workaround in relation to that. And I think what it, it does highlight, certainly from the experience of polio, the importance of the convening power of the World Health Organization, but critically, the importance of member states engaging bilaterally with their neighbors and more broadly within a regional context to really make sure that this issue uh, really gets the appropriate focus because nothing can change the importance of political will in terms of driving urgency, in terms of driving political priority, in terms of driving accountability. And this is really the key in terms of responding to emergencies if and when they occur, wherever they occur. On that note, I'll pass the floor back to you, Ria. Thank you. Dr. Saltak, based on your extensive experience, what was the specificity of the Asia-Pacific region in responding to COVID-19? Well, thank you also uh, for the opportunity to join today. Um, of course, <clears throat> and I, I, I'm very grateful that I got to hear our colleagues prior, Dr. Vora, Professor Cunningham, and also the comments from um, Mr. O'Leary. Of course, Asia Pacific, it's not a monolith. Uh, we're talking about um, where we work at the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance, supporting 21 countries and heads of state uh, who have committed to the goal of malaria elimination by 2030. And I think the last comment on political will um, is precisely a perfect segue into what we try to do alongside our national programs and colleagues from the various WHO regions and so many other actors. And so in that regard to your question specifically, you know, when we look at malaria, uh, we think about the fact, we should think about the fact that this is something that has already been eliminated from 40 countries in the world. This is something that we already have the tools and the technology um, and in many cases, the adequate resources for. Um, but it is becoming increasingly evident that the political will is critical and leadership and steadfast leadership. And so when you ask about COVID, uh, I put it in the context of malaria. If you look at um, what was anticipated, and of course, I mean, I think some time, it will take some time to see what the data bears out. But over the last 18 months, what we have seen are some incredible examples of leadership in governments, um, particularly places like Sri Lanka, uh, Cambodia, Pakistan, where we've seen a real ability to adopt um, a different approach, an adaptable approach to ensure that the COVID response also be maintained while the trajectory towards malaria elimination could be preserved to some extent. That is not to say that malaria elimination is on track in, in, in the region by no means. But I think the, probably the most important lesson for me and for us as we look at malaria moving forward and COVID here is we, what we know in Asia Pacific is that 90% of the infections are happening in about a, a handful of countries, approximately four countries, Indonesia, Pakistan, India, Papua New Guinea. And when you look at those countries, even within those countries, what we're talking about is subnational epidemics. And this goes back to the session just prior, 
what we need to be able to do is understand that political advocacy at the highest levels needs to be appropriately to the evidence that emerges from those pockets of endemicity to ensure that we can reach the last mile. And in the process of doing so, we will also be forced to take on more integration, more ability to figure out how we're going to leverage the tools, the surveillance, the management and ability to use data effectively. And so if anything, for us in Asia Pacific, it is very much the case that um, both COVID and malaria will require significant political will linked to technical advocacy that emerges from the places where the systems may be the weakest. Over. Okay. Mr. Meleri, how do you see the COVID-19 pandemic contributing towards creating stronger and more resilient health systems in facing future pandemics while ensuring that no one is left behind? Thanks very much, Ria. Again, I think the, the answer to the, the question is really around the uh, importance of uh, the, the information that's generated on what happens if you don't respond. Mm. And uh, I think uh, what the pandemic has demonstrated more than anything else is that there is no choice but to respond. And uh, from the, the Polio Oversight Board, from a polio perspective, all polio assets and infrastructure where we dedicated and repurposed in support of pandemic response uh, in the course of 2020, as well as in 2021. And if I can perhaps, uh, Sarthak talked a little bit about some of the exemplars within the uh, Asia specific region, I would perhaps take the example of Pakistan. Um, and in Pakistan, there's perhaps two examples where existing infrastructures were simply repurposed towards uh, addressing the pandemic response. So the emergency operations centers uh, were repurposed into the National COVID Operations Center. And you had essentially the top officials across the country at our national, at provincial, at district level, coming together to uh, or, uh, basically review uh, real-time data, uh, taking real-time decisions, and really following through in terms of uh, decision-making in terms of accountability for follow-up. And so for me, this kind of way of doing business uh, is a, a really essential part going forward. Similarly, the, the, or the polio hotline 1166 was rededicated to support a, uh, a COVID hotline where you essentially had or basically all requests, whether it was for uh, vaccine appointments, whether it was for information, uh, again, being brought to a, a central, well-known location uh, with simply the, the content being changed. So for me, I think the important point when we talk about resilience is to really emphasize the importance of the core components of response will be the same irrespective of the, uh, the different disease types in which uh, we will have to respond. I think the second point that I would highlight in terms of resiliency uh, is uh, our engagement with communities. And I think as we all know, community acceptance, confidence and trust is ultimately the key towards effective public health service delivery. Mm. And I think in the previous session, we talked around uh, misinformation, disinformation and rumours. And I, I simply can't emphasise enough the importance of that really close engagement with communities to understand what their concerns are, to understand what their issues are, and looking at ways in which those issues can be effectively addressed. And that's not through naming and shaming, that's working through the appropriate uh, community structures that in, are in place. Whether that is religious leaders, whether that is medical leaders, whether that is respected community leaders, whether it is respected political leaders, but we have to find a better way to really make sure that we are correctly identifying and then responding to those community needs. Because ultimately, we'll not succeed unless we're able to address those. And as I mentioned in the earlier part, the reasons that we're not able to uh, address the, are these communities, they can be varied, but we must find a way. It's not just the majority. We need to really be working from the start to address all of those concerns. 
And then I think that the last point that I would or highlight under this uh, or heading is again to come back to the issue of uh, political will. Uh, political will comes not just in the form of financial support, political will comes through leadership. And that leadership and engagement is absolutely critical if we're going to develop the type of resilience that's required. Will there be technical disagreements? Will there be what our, the chair of our independent monitoring board refers to as the rocky road to zero? Will we come across obstacles and problems and so on? Of course we will. Our challenge is not whether we're going to be confronted with these challenges. The challenge is going to be, how do we actually address them? And political will is absolutely imperative towards driving that forward. And I think what the pandemic has demonstrated is that where you have political will effectively deployed at all levels, real progress can be made. And I think what is going to be really important for us as a community going forward is to really make sure that the best scientific advice, the best operational advice, the best risk advice is available to really make sure that we have effective and informed decision making so that we can follow that critical path to take us to a, a safer place for our communities, for our countries, for our region, as well as the globe. Back to you, Ria. Yes, thank you, Mr. O'Leary. And uh, I cannot uh, emphasize enough the importance of social uh, listening and community outreach. And as far as political leadership, transparency is very important as well with the, with the community in sharing information and uh, the, the actual situation. Thank you so much. Uh, as far as you are concerned, Dr. Seltak, what are the main lessons learned and the challenges faced in the last miles of disease elimination, specifically malaria? Thank you. Um, so <clears throat> I really appreciate the question. And I, I, I think that the in describing the last mile, I, I, I think there are things that are specific to the last mile. but. I want everyone to bear in mind that we can extrapolate. And so I'll focus on three things. The first is that there is no substitute for quality. So the three things I wanna talk about are quality, trust, and management. And I think we need a new paradigm when we think about developing health systems, particularly where they are the weakest to prevent the next pandemic, that looks at those three things in a very different way, almost in a way that is um, inverted, if you will, to think about allowing for indigenous or local adaptation of in a more effective way. First, the first piece about is about quality. We can't expect that a place that doesn't have access to oxygen for children or people who are in respiratory distress or where their substandard medicines is going to foster a lot of, or where communication, public health communication is poor, um, is going to succeed in fostering trust, particularly, let's say, between the public sector um, and the community. And what we've seen, and I've seen this in living in Papua New Guinea for seven years in the Highlands or as part of the Ebola response, but we see this over and over and over again. And currently, unfortunately, actually, Papua New Guinea is a great example of vaccine hesitancy um, with some of the lowest vaccination rates in the world. And so if there isn't a fundamental level of quality of health service delivery, then how do we get to number two? How do we get to trust? Where there is trust in the public sector and a belief that that is a place where I will go and I will be taken care of with what is appropriate and what is required and necessary. And the third piece I wanted to mention was about, is about management. And the reason why I bring up management is when we think about as, as was mentioned in a different example in regards to surveillance, surveillance being downstream, we need to think more upstream. Well, if we think about surveillance or we think about managing data or we think about being able to proactively plan for managing an outbreak, um, containing an outbreak, what we really come back to is effective use of data, effective public health planning and an effective use of resources that then obviously connect back to a provincial capital or to uh, for many I'm malaria one of them um, where systems have been successfully 
straight built and that polyurethanes were also described here. And so when we think about those last pockets, Jesus, one, I wear, we don't de emphasize absolutely, but really sound public management and the capacity um, to build uh, better systems at the district and subnational level, a way that allows for those systems to be built, let's say, over four years or five years funding rather than a project cycle that might run two years or three years. We're near collapse in terms of public health systems. We're talking about a fire come back to the very first point where we deliver a sufficient quality of care that can engender trust um, and be able to address the kind of response that we over. Thank you, Dr. Sartak. The connection was not very well at the end. Thank you for being with us today and for sharing your uh, uh, valuable experience uh, in the, and your remarks. Thank you so much. Okay, now uh, we're going to move uh, into a very interesting session because it's an interactive session. Okay. Uh, and uh, you will be like, uh, you'll be the decision maker and you're going to, uh, to have your say in dealing with uh, an emerging infectious disease. What would you do in this case? Okay, coming from a certain, from your experience and from your own background. So after more than two years of an active COVID-19 pandemic, a multitude of measures, actions, and initiatives have been taken in an attempt to stop the spread of the disease and to prevent further outbreaks. Many lessons can be learned from the successes and setbacks of this continuous fight. I'm pleased to introduce an interactive pandemic emergence simulation activity which will offer you the chance to be the decision maker and share what we would do with the emergence of an unknown yet quickly spreading disease. Okay, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Richard Brennan, Regional Emergency Director at WHO AMRO, and Dr. Tom Loney, Associate Professor of Public Health and Epidemiology, College of Medicine, Mohammed bin Rashid University. They will be co-leading the simulation. Please, the floor is yours. With our virtual and in-person audiences uh, through the simulation. So uh, simulation exercises, as uh, most of you are probably aware, really important component of our preparedness. Uh, we, uh, we use them to test our systems, to test assumptions, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, there are various types of simulations from a tabletop exercise, kind of what we're doing today, all the way through to full-blown field exercises. Um, and again, they, they serve different purposes. Um, we've got a lot to get through today, so I'll, I'll try to be brief, but I, I think that uh, what you'll find is that this exercise, this simulation, will build on a lot of the points made from the last couple of presentations. Um, we're really going to highlight the importance of a robust initial public health response. Uh, we're going to highlight the points of, of governance and, and uh, responsible leadership and coordination. We're going to highlight the, point, the importance of strong communications and engagement with communities, uh, uh, as well as how do we prioritize the allocation of limited resources. Uh, if we get through a little bit more, uh, we'll even touch on, on the very important issue of equity. Um, so with that, let, let me pause and hand over to Tom, uh, who's going to walk us through uh, the process and uh, the, uh, the first inject of the scenario. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Richard. So a very warm welcome and good afternoon to you all. Um, uh, my role is the facilitator, is to try and engage you and energize you um, to help us work through this emerging epidemic. So, 
Uh, in order to do that, we're going to use a piece of software called uh, Mentimeter. Many of you may be familiar with this. So what I'll ask you to do first of all uh, is to open up your camera and to point it on the QR code. Uh, and this will take you um, uh, to menti.com. Uh, otherwise, you can enter the uh, web address and then the code 3892266. Uh, so the general format is going to be um, I will provide you with some information uh, on this uh, recent outbreak. Um, and then using the Mentimeter, I will uh, ask you to vote on a series of possible options. Uh, again, there's no right or wrong answer. Uh, you can uh, make multiple responses, or you can just select one response. And then I'm going to invite uh, members of the audience uh, to discuss why they have made uh, certain decisions around certain measures um, or policy decisions. Uh, and then, uh, so each uh, section of the outbreak, we will have around three questions uh, where we'll have some interactive discussions. And then we will um, invite uh, Dr. Richard to give his expert opinion uh, from the WHO. So without wasting uh, any more time, let's move on to the first piece of information about the outbreak. So it's a new unknown disease that has emerged. Um, currently, what we know is that five healthcare workers, including nurses and doctors, uh, have recently died. Uh, this is taking place in City A. Um, and this is over a two-week period, uh, and these initial cases, these initial cases that died, reported symptoms of high fever, cough, chest pain, and headache. And interestingly, the father of one of the nurses um, also died last week. He suffered from similar symptoms um, and reported difficulty in breathing. He developed bilateral pneumonia, uh, followed by an acute respiratory dis distress syndrome uh, before dying. So the first thing we're thinking about, is it an animal origin? Is this a possible zoonotic disease, which uh, was covered by some of the speakers in the first part of the session? So in a nearby village, there are reports of the deaths of 250 domestic chickens and ducks, as well as uh, 27 pigs. So this is now generating quite a lot of media hype, and, uh, and the lo local outlets are claiming that disease could have originated from animals. Uh, but the exact source is not yet known. So the first question, obviously time is of the essence with an outbreak. You have to make decisions, but you also have to make appropriate decisions. So the first question is, what set of actions would you recommend to take first? And I, I will read them out because uh, uh, the text is quite small, but you should also be able to see them on your uh, on your phone. So do you establish mass testing measures and contact tracing? Do you initiate a citywide quarantine with military checkpoints? Enhance surveillance and investigation to rapidly detect cases? Uh, recommend self-protective actions such as hand washing and safe distancing? Uh, do you limit actions uh, to monitoring with no restrictive measures? We can already see uh, quite a strong pattern emerging there with, uh, with responses. Um, maybe first of all, I'll, in, uh, I'll ask the audience, why, why haven't many people opted for a city-wide quarantine with military checkpoints? So we have a, we have a number of uh, microphones going around. So why, why aren't people, I mean, if we want to shut this, uh, this outbreak down quickly, surely we... We just uh, lock everyone down. We put the military checkpoints in place. Uh, the gentleman in the middle, please. Hi, thanks for that. I think that uh, that one is not the right way forward because you're not controlling the disease at the outset. It's about contact tracing, find what the origins are, and isolation. Those are kind of the first aspects of managing a pandemic rather than going for the full military checkpoints and quarantining a whole city. Okay, and do, do you think there would be any potential negative ramifications if, if you did go for uh, city-wide quarantine? Yeah, well, judging by people's reaction to vaccines, I suspect you'll get some furor from the local public and you might get a lot of uh, noise <laughs> that might be unnecessary. Okay, so that, that, that uh, particular response could, could initiate some uh, uh, public movement that we're not necessarily looking for during the initial stages of an outbreak. So would anyone else like to comment on the, the number one seems to be enhancing surveillance? Perhaps you would like to maybe some of the audience talk about exactly how you would do that. 
So the gentleman at the front. Uh, I think Austin Demby, Minister of Health, Sierra Leone. I, I think you know what's happening in City A, but you don't know what's happening in the rest of the country. So it's really important that you put word out is that active surveillance, active case finding, have all of the hospitals record the kinds of clinical signs and symptoms that you're seeing there to see if there's report of it and um, uh, use that as a basis of uh, identifying the extent of the outbreak um, and then you could look at preventive measures then. Excellent. I think that's very good advice. So this is very, very early on in the outbreak. We don't want to uh, cause any mass panic or mass movement of people around the country. We need more information. We need, we need more data. So to do that, we need to, to upskill our, our surveillance. So we'll move on to our, our second question. So that's our initial response. What additional measures would you put in place? Would you continue to monitor the situation with no additional measures? Would you establish a response and coordination mechanism? Activate the Public Health Emergency Operations Centre? Would you cull the poultry across the whole district or perhaps country? Uh, would you impose a country-wide lockdown? Or perhaps you have a, another suggestion? Okay, so as responses are coming in, I will invite members of the audience. I know we have a number of um, uh, individuals here that have been involved in uh, particularly the recent uh, COVID-19 outbreak, uh, both here in the UAE and other countries. So we welcome you to contribute uh, any thoughts uh, on this new uh, novel um, outbreak that we're simulating. Okay, uh, the gentleman at the front, please, if we have a microphone. Thank you. Madam Naimi, Abu Dhabi Public Health. I think this is a very important steps that um, has been taken. The, I will go first with the activation of uh, Public Health Emergency Operation Center. Uh, it's very important, as you said, that the, the, the first question to know the source, to collect data especially from healthcare provider. So by activating the uh, operation center, the medical one, you can collect more data within city A or, uh, and also uh, from other cities. Uh, it is uh, the critical question, what is the source of this infection uh, spreading among uh, those uh, healthcare workers? Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. And the gentleman behind, did you have your hand raised? Okay, the lady in the middle row. Yes, so thank you so much. So I I'm just going to comment on the continue to monitor the situation with no additional measures. Uh, from my point of view, I don't think this makes sense. If you don't understand like what's the situation exactly, how can you say that you are going to continue to monitor but without additional measures? So um, that is also why it is so important to activate the Public Health Emergency Operations Center and to establish the response and coordination itself so that you can actually access if you need more additional measures or not. Okay, excellent point. So we mustn't remain static, we must be agile. So we, we need to move and, and make a response and upskill our operations. I can see that uh, a few people have gone for, obviously don't like chickens, have gone for culling poultry. So uh, was there anyone in the audience who chose the, the mass culling of poultry? Why that would be a, a good idea or not a good idea? So the, the lady on the, on the end. So I do choose that. Okay. Um, just to I won't blame you. Clear. Yeah. So I think there's two things that we need to establish. One is the association between whether the cases and the gentleman dying has anything to do with the animals dying as well. So you need to make sure whether there's a contact between that, whether that's happened or not. And um, the second thing is defining a case definition for what this disease is. So through laboratory testing to make sure contact te testing is there. So those are the two things. And that's why you wouldn't actually blow it up into a big situation until you've made sure that there's an association there and what actually the disease is. Excellent point. So this... At this stage, we, we don't have a, uh, a case definition, which is vital in any outbreak. Uh, and also, we, we don't necessarily know that uh, 
this uh, outbreak is of zoonotic origin, so we wouldn't go and maybe destroy some people's livelihoods by, by culling uh, all of the chickens. So then the next question would be, what actions would you recommend for streamlining implementation of response measures? So now we need to be a little bit more focused, uh, developing a contingency plan, activate, review, and update existing public health emergency preparedness and response plans, prevent discussing the event in the media to avoid panic, limit information sharing with other sectors, or other. Okay, so there's quite a strong uh, initial response quickly uh, to, to activating and reviewing. Maybe whilst people are still um, deciding, it's quite evenly split. So there have been no votes for um, preventing communication with the public um, or for intersectoral communication. So I don't know whether anyone in the audience would like to uh, discuss either of those options. Okay, the gentleman in the middle. So I'm not hugging the microphone. It's I'm Shafi Ahmed, I'm professor of surgery at the Royal London Hospital. So the, the reason, one of the problems we've had during the pandemic is lack of communication. And actually, we weren't honest and transparent enough during the early stages of the pandemic, and that's caused a lot of anxieties. So that's why, obviously, the prevent discussing the event in public media to avoid panic actually is counterintuitive. It actually reassure people that things are happening and the communication in. If there's one thing we learned from this pandemic recently, it's that lack of communication on a global level. Excellent point. We need uh, good, effective public health communication. So we'll move to the, the lady here in the middle, and then I will ask Dr. Richard to give his expert opinion. Thank you. I would just like to add something about communication and social media. I agree that we must not prevent the discussion, but I also think that we should be caref very careful on the way that we share information. And at the same time, sometimes when we aren't sure of the actual result or of the actual impact that this will have on people's lives, then we need to think twice or, or three times before the information is shared by the government, and especially also by politicians, because this will actually impact the way that people see the pandemic, and it will actually impact the way that people adhere or not to the public health measures, simple as sanita sanitization and, and hygiene, for example. Excellent point. So it's a, it's a delicate balance between making sure we provide some information, but if we're not sure about certain facts and figures that we, we don't misinform the public. So at this stage, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Richard for his expert opinion uh, following the, the first few questions. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. Uh, great, uh, great discussion and some, some good answers there, some interesting, interesting responses. You know, I, I think uh, based on the scenario as public health, uh, practitioners and clinicians, our alarm bells are really going to be ringing when we hear of uh, an evolving event like this. You've got uh, five cases amongst healthcare workers, two of whom have died. One of them has a father who's died. Uh, you've got uh, deaths amongst uh, farm animals. Uh, there's got to be an assumption of human to human transmission. Um, I think already this is beginning to smell uh, like avian influenza or something similar. Um, so we need to we need to act and we need to act quickly. Um, we need to uh, take, I think, a number of steps, essentially simultaneously. We need to investigate and, and increase our surveillance. Um, we need to rapidly impose uh, control measures. Uh, we need to set up our response structure and our coordination structure. And um, we need to be uh, communicating proactively because you can bet your bottom dollar that rumors are already going to start spreading. So let me uh, just flesh out a little bit more on each of those. So in terms of investigation, you need a rapid response team on the ground looking into this straight away. Uh, we need to describe the outbreak through the, you know, the classic uh, epidemiological descriptors of time, place, person. Um, you, uh, you want to look at a potential source, as a couple of others have said, you know, from, uh, from the farms. But of course, you want to uh, do the laboratory investigation as well. Um, in terms of the control measures, it's really important, as a couple of people said, to, to have a, a clear case definition uh, to provide uh, to, you know, we've got this assumption of human, human transmission, so we want to isolate cases, we want to uh, follow their contacts, 
uh, we want to provide, you know, this is a serious disease. We want to make sure that any, any uh, cases or patients with the disease um, have, uh, have access to good clinical care. And we need to protect our healthcare workers uh, as well. We need to employ a strong infection prevention and control mechanisms. Um, we, we have to take a precautionary approach here. We have to really assume that things could escalate. Uh, they may not, but let's make sure that we're organized. So there, therefore, your response structure and your coordination structure has to be stood up very, very quickly. Uh, the way that we structure and manage response to emergencies, including outbreaks in, in public health these days, we use what's called the instant management system. Um, it's, uh, it's an emergency management best practice. Just uh, for your information, WHO, we, we heard about um, the first cases of, of, uh, of COVID back on the 31st of December in uh, uh, what was it, uh, 2000. And um, uh, within 24 hours, at our headquarters had set up their incident management system, their structure for managing the response. The, the final point, again, is getting is proactively uh, communicating uh, with the community, uh, being honest, being transparent, uh, being empathetic, being hopeful, uh, clarifying that uncertainty is part of the game here, uh, but reassuring the community that we will get back to them as, as soon and as regularly as, in, uh, as more information is available. Thanks, Tom. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. Um, some lots of interesting points. I think that we will have the time to circle back to later. Um, as you mentioned, uh, sort of leather sole epidemiology, you need boots on the ground. You need some outbreak investors, investigators, uh, you know, collecting um, data on cases. So we now have some, some new data that is coming in. Uh, we, we now have um, 1,500 new confirmed cases. And you can see in the, the bottom right-hand corner, this is a simple epidemic curve, which shows the number of cases uh, across uh, time by, by the number of days uh, over one month. So despite all, all the country's efforts to control transmission, we have 1,500 cases uh, that have been confirmed in the same village in the space of just one week. Um, it's still not clear uh, how they contracted the virus, so we don't know about the, the mode of transmission. About 70% of the patients are coming from uh, these clusters within the, uh, the, the rural centers. And now we have some of these so social tensions that are, that are rising uh, between the poorer areas of the city um, who are accused of, of not doing enough to, to prevent transmission and contagion and also causing the spread of the disease and these wealthier neighborhoods who are being accused of marginalizing some of the poorer groups. So the initial laboratory report suggests an unknown but highly transmissive um, strain of influenza. Um, at this point, there is some, I guess, uh, social unrest. The, the trust between citizens and public health organizations is reaching a record low, uh, making it very difficult to impose uh, restrictions and new preventive and protective measures. So you need that engagement for, from the public. Uh, online groups are already fueling misinformation through social media. So, now we know we have a bit more data. We know that it's spreading quickly. What action would you recommend next? Would you continue with the same testing and laboratory, uh, sorry, isolating measures? Review, adapt, and enhance measures for surveillance, investigation, testing, contact tracing, quarantine, isolation, and case management. Would you initiate a nationwide lockdown and travel ban? Uh, would you limit actions to monitoring and, and testing, counting on herd immunity to protect the population? Or perhaps you have a, another suggestion that we haven't included. So again, the, the initial responses seem to be clustering towards reviewing and adapting with uh, with maybe a quarter of the audience uh, wanting to initiate a nationwide lockdown. So perhaps some of the audience would like to comment who, who chose that option or was maybe for or against a nationwide lockdown. Anyone supporting a nationwide lockdown or would be strongly against a nationwide lockdown? Or someone, perhaps someone would like to comment on the, the reasons why we need to in, increase the testing and contact tracing and, and how you would do that 
in this uh, in this rural setting. So, gentleman in the middle. Um, about the nationwide uh, lockdown. That makes me think about that would be the quickest way to control the situation, bear in mind that the population is into um, a crisis mode, while uh, as a secondary, uh, while, while you w work more progressive measures. So this could be a good way to contain it. Uh, bear in mind that you said the population is kind of in a crisis mode, and to address that would take a lot, bit more time. So I would I would favor, um, I mean, it's not like I, I'm a decision maker, but this could be a very quick way to contain, uh, bearing in mind that then the, now the other nations may have an eye on that country and will um, we'll put some pressure to, for some quick actions. That, that's... Yeah. Okay, the lady, uh, so yes, behind. So just a quick one on that. In terms of a nationwide lockdown, I think we'd also have to consider the economic effects that that would have on the population and whether the pandemic was not pandemic yet, but whether it was at a stage where in which you would want to subject the country to, you know, supply chain problems, resource shortages, shortages of staff and positions, um, you know, even key positions in hospitals, etc. So that's one consideration for why you might not want to jump to a nationwide lockdown that quickly if you only have small clusters of cases in rural areas at this stage. I agree. Uh, gentlemen at the front of me, is a fine balance between lives and, and livelihoods. So uh, we don't know the extent of it right now, but it looks like it's a very restricted um, outbreak in a particular region. So we will ask for uh, restricting movement to that to and from that particular area. I, I don't like the word lockdown. Uh, it's got a negative connotation to it. It looks like you're imprisoning people. But if we have restricted movement in and out of that particular area, I think that will go towards a solution. One thing I haven't heard is, um, you know, the veterinary component of all of this. You know, we, we're looking at a One Health solution that should not be only looking at human health, but also looking at what's happening in the animal space. Okay, some uh, excellent points there, um, particularly related to how we maybe label um, uh, containment measures uh, and how they can be perceived uh, by, the, by the population. Uh, the lady here. Uh, yes, so just to add there, because I, I don't remember now, I forgot, but this community is more like poverty or in terms of social economical aspect. It's a rural population. I think we could probably assume that it would be a sort of lower SES than, than maybe the wealthier mm -hmm. urban areas. So I would pay more attention to the isolating measures part. How could the public health sector support this, taking this into account of the population, actually? Because maybe people wouldn't have the necessary conditions to do that. Okay, excellent point. So we're now focusing our, our time, effort, and resources. So you have this the lady here, please. Yeah, Princess, um, I'm looking at limit uh, action to monitoring and testing, counting on herd immunity. I will not go down that line because um, waiting for herd immunity takes a long time. And probably the population, you have people that have underlying diseases, so you have to be isolating and testing as well. Excellent point. And the herd immunity, we, I don't think we know enough about the dynamics of the, the disease at the moment in terms of um, you know, duration of infection and also uh, protection. Thank you. Um, just a point around health promotion and health literacy as well. Um, if I remember correctly, in the last slide, there seemed to be quite a bit of resentment between the poorer households and the more affluent house households. And one would assume, in a kind of, if this is an infectious disease, that's to do with density as well of living conditions. So one of the areas is about mobilising community health workers, for example, to work with the pure, um, poorer households in terms of their living conditions and make sure that they understand about the transmission of infectious diseases and how to limit that within their own household as well. Another excellent point. So we're going to move on to the next question. So what action would you recommend to ensure proper leadership? Would you limit the discussion and coordination uh, to the health and animal sectors only? Place the most senior public health 
experts in the key decision-making positions, expand the response structure to engage highest levels of government and all relevant ministries, intensify the lockdown, travel and trade bans, or perhaps you have another um, suggestion. So at the moment we seem to be leaning towards making sure we have senior public health um, experts at least involved in the key decision making positions. But the majority response seems to be expanding the response structure to engage the highest levels of government and relevant ministries. So would anyone like to, to comment on, on why they think that is one of the most important or at least one of the it's almost equal now, actually, but uh, comment on, on why they think engaging government and relevant ministries may help the response. So, gentlemen at the front, if we could have the microphone down here. Yes, thank you. Uh, expand the, the, I mean, the information to the top of the chain command is very important. This is, uh, it looks like highly spreading infection and the political commitment leadership uh, should be aware of what is happening right away to take the right decision. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. So the uh, lady in the middle. Yes, thank you. So besides including ministries and government, I would also include someone from the community that was recognized as a leader by their community because then in terms of political will, it will be easier to implement certain measures, I believe, inside the community itself. So that's an excellent point. So the, the first response we're talking about, making sure that we have uh, the, the government at the top, you know, who, who are able to make decisions, the leadership across different sectors, um, with public health experts also providing some, uh, their expert opinion. But also, if we want... Uh, many of these, these measures are going to impact on the population, so we probably need some members of the population, particularly the rural community, um, to be involved in, in the decision-making. So before I ask um, uh, Richard for his comments, we have one more question to answer on, on this section. So what set of measures would you recommend to engage communities and address misinformation? So this has been discussed in a few of the earlier talks in this session today. Um, would you keep the public informed? Would you encourage two-way communications using multiple channels and means? Uh, monitor the social media and apply censorship on online platforms. Uh, use aggressive punitive measures against those trying to fuel the situation. Or perhaps you have another. Okay, so the majority of the audience are definitely for keeping the public informed. Uh, and to encourage two-way communication. So would anyone like to discuss their experience uh, of, uh, of two-way communication or, or what would be the, particularly in, in our setting, what would be the, the best way of achieving that? I, I think um, encouraging two-way communications and keeping the public informed are you know, two um, um, sides of the same coin. I, I think it's really important in both cases to make sure that um, the face of the response is a trusted figure. It's really important that as you battle the um, social media and, and the uh, information that's the misinformation that's coming from elsewhere, that no matter what it is, it need not be a politician, it need not be a top scientist. It has to be somebody that the public trusts, the public believes, somebody that has a track record of always telling the truth to power. It's always been uh, uh, reliable uh, for information of this nature, uh, like a Tony Fauci. Excellent. So um, the, the importance there of not just um, the, what the message is and who you're communicating, but who is delivering that message. Uh, and that may need to be different depending on the setting. Uh, obviously, we have a, a rural and we have an urban area. Uh, I can see the, the lady here would like to make a comment. Yes, I would like to make a comment because two years ago uh, in our organization we did a survey to access how youth could actually help and what would be the obstacles to actually help to mitigate misinformation. And some important and uh, points that I would like to mention is that 
for example, youth within their household and within their family, they can actually be the people that help to, let's say, to, to give the right information. And uh, also that we need to understand like what are also the platforms that are used within different countries and within different ages. Because, for example, if we go to Brazil, for example, the most used platform can be WhatsApp. If we go to another country, it can be another one. So how can we actually use WhatsApp, for example, to mitigate this disinformation? And I remember that WHO had a very interesting thing where people could go on WhatsApp and actually ask for information about certain matters. So there is these different approaches that we need to take into account. And there are people, in this case youth, that are part of their families that can actually actively help every day to mitigate misinformation. Excellent point. So, and, and this will give me a good opportunity to segue to, to Richard. Uh, but there is, you know, what is the, what is the medium of, uh, of communication empowering the, the, the youth, particularly if it's going to be some form of digital or, or social media? Uh, and perhaps I would ask Richard to share his views and experiences on this public health communication. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks very much, Tom. And again, some, some great insights there from, uh, from the participants. Um, perhaps I'll pick up on, on, on three themes uh, that have emerged from the, the questions and uh, some of the, the responses. Firstly, um, how we use the tools available to us to, to control the spread of disease. Secondly, again, this important issue of leadership and coordination. And thirdly, of course, uh, the, the communications and community engagement. On the first one, uh, the tools available to us. Um, you know, the most precise um, public health interventions that we have are the things that we've, that we've touched on earlier. Uh, the surveillance, the testing and tracing, the contact tracing, uh, the isolation, the good case management, the infection prevention and control, promoting those measures uh, in the community that we know help uh, protect individuals and help them protect their families, like the social distancing and hand washing. These are the kind of things that we really want to optimize early in the response. Um, national lockdowns, uh, blanket travel and trade uh, bans, we would call those blunt instruments. Um, you know, and we wouldn't jump to those immediately uh, until we've really optimized our use of the other more effective tools. I mean, certainly you can have more targeted um, measures such as um, perhaps, uh, I think one, one, one respondent said something about perhaps quarantining the village or the town. That may be an option. Uh, you certainly want to do that before you go for a national lockdown. Um, another, other options are to you know, temporarily close non-essential businesses and so on. So there's a, there's a gradation, there's a calibration, if you like, of these blunt instruments. But let's really optimize the strong public health tools uh, that we have before um, you know, coming down on, on the population with national lockdowns, which as uh, several of you have said, can have real economic and social and even political consequences. Um, on, the, on the second issue of leadership and coordination, engaging the highest levels of government, I think that there's been a couple of studies actually that have shown that responsible leadership have been more important uh, in influencing an effective response than some of the objective measures of preparedness through the IHR core capacities, through what's called the joint external evaluations and um, the annual reporting that countries do on, on their uh, readiness to, to respond to a pandemic. So responsible leadership is absolutely vital. And to get the highest levels of government involved and committed uh, is, is, is key to an effective response. Um, that's provided, of course, that leadership listens to the science and, and, and acts on, on the evidence base. And in fact, as you think, you know, as, as you've got an expanding event like this, you've got to think about how your management and coordination structures evolve as well. And hopefully they will be informed by the, the national preparedness plan that we touched on earlier in one of the earlier questions. So of course, within health, we, we, we've got to organize ourselves, but then there's another layer of coordination there. Um, we've got to reach out to the, to the other uh, relevant sectors. Um, One Health, the agricultural sector, the environmental sector, transport, uh, customs and, and, and on and on and on. Education, these all have to be engaged as well. There's another layer of, of, of leadership and coordination at the executive level as, as these events expand. And again, 
the, the responsibility of the health sector and the multi sectoral coordination mechanisms is, is to ensure that the executive, the highest levels of government, have all the information that they need on a timely basis so they can make the tough decisions and make the calls, not only on scaling up the public health measures, but again, using some of these blunt instruments like, um, like lockdowns and, and business closures and school closures and travel bans and, and what have you. It's a gradation over time. Finally, on, on the issue of uh, communications and, and engaging communities, you know, my, my big boss at the headquarters, Mike Ryan, uh, Dr. Mike Ryan, who many of you may have seen on the media, he always says, outbreaks start and end in communities. So we've got to engage them. Um, and I think some of the basics of communications we all understand, and I touched on some of that earlier about being truthful, being transparent, you know, getting back to people regularly. But we've got to be a little bit more sophisticated about how we manage our communications these days. The way that people receive, absorb, and transmit uh, information these days has changed a lot in the last decade or two. Social media is so important. So I think it was Rewa who mentioned earlier the social listening. How are we tapping into the, the social media? How are we hearing what communities are saying about, um, uh, about the outbreak? How are we engaging communities through um, influences and uh, focus group discussions and so on? How are they responding to what we're telling them about the outbreak? And then once we've absorbed that information through our social list listening, through our feedback loops, then how are then we going back and adjusting our messaging and our responses to the community in a way that they find uh, understandable and as acceptable as possible? Thanks a lot, Tom. Excellent. Thank you, Richard. I mean, one point that, that really jumped out to me there was the importance of both horizontal communication, so making sure that we're, we're talking across organizations and also reaching the whole of the population, but also vertical, uh, vertical communication. So we make sure that the public have a two-way communication portal um, with uh, various organizations, but most importantly, with the um, decision makers uh, and the leadership. So we're given some more information now. The virus continues to spread. Unfortunately, it's now spread to most villages uh, and cities uh, in, in the country with reports of thousands of cases and deaths. Um, the, the current uh, case fatality ratio, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, is, is around 7%. Uh, the country managed to send a sample to one of the WHO reference laboratories, and the results confirmed a new strain of highly pathogenic avian influenza. The country is not a main hub for travel, but does have travel and trade relations with many countries around the world, uh, and reports on suspected cases have been received from other countries outside the initial country. Um, so the investigation is ongoing to identify the, the source of infection. So now moving back to the media, a report from a popular national television channel highlights it, a, a limited supply of antiviral drugs uh, and vaccines currently remain unavailable. There have also been rumors that the country does not have access to sufficient quantities of uh, critical pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical supplies, and the tension between the government and the population continues to rise with reports of protesting and demonstrations in some regions. So we're now at the stage uh, where it's got a bit more serious. It's spread to another country. What escalation measures could you recommend for this situation? Accelerate the national scale up of public health measures, surveillance, testing, sequencing, quarantine. Suspend all other non-essential health services to reduce burden on the health facilities. Limit the use of personal protective equipment to healthcare workers only to conserve limited supplies and ration testing capacities to the affected villages and cities. Or perhaps you have another um, option. Okay, so quite evenly split at the moment. With the, is there anyone in the audience that would like to offer their opinions or thoughts or experiences whilst the audience are continuing to vote? So the gentleman on the right-hand side. 
Thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, Rahib Ali um, from NY Abu Dhabi and also was involved in the UK uh, response. So I'm also a clinician and have some experience in the UK at least on how we dealt with, uh, with COVID. And it does obviously depend on the situation in this fictional country. But many countries did struggle uh, to maintain all health services during the peak of COVID, including high income countries in Europe. And so it would seem to be reasonable to suspend non-essential health services to ensure that all emergencies can be treated. And secondly, again, at the beginning of COVID, even in high income countries, there was a lack of PPE. Um, so again, it would make sense to, to prioritise healthcare workers uh, to make sure that they are able to continue working and, and uh, are protected from the disease. So those two things, I think, are really important. Um, assuming that there is a limited health uh, supply, which is the case in most countries. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, we'll, we'll move on to the next question. So what measures would you recommend to address limited access to medical countermeasures? Re-emphasize re the importance of public health and self-protective measures um, as the main method to combat infection, enhance research and development efforts in the country, Share samples actively with international reference laboratories, such as the WHO, and engage in clinical trials. Distribute the available antivirals on a first-come, first-served basis, or another option. Again, I'll invite anyone from the audience. This is meant to be interactive, so as people are making their, um, their choices, whether you can offer your experiences or opinions on this current outbreak. So we seem to be definitely engaged with sharing samples, which is good because we need a, a concerted effort uh, across countries and regions, particularly as we know it's now spreading uh, between different areas. Um, also, we need individuals to take the responsibility of um, the public health measures. Uh, so the, uh, the lady here, please. That's right. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, in addition to uh, these measures, we need to uh, earlier on initiate uh, researches and uh, uh, ensure uh, uh, to collect more information either uh, locally and from the uh, surrounding countries to ensure uh, that uh, all uh, that all the cases are from the same sources or from different sources. So uh, researches is uh, crucial in. Um, uh, taking any decisions uh, either from preventive sites or treatment sites? That's an excellent point because uh, we, we need data and, and we need to uh, initiate you know, rapid pandemic uh, research. And obviously it needs to be done ethically, so it needs to be done very quickly, but we also need the data very quickly. Uh, so the, we'll have one more comment from the lady here and then we will go to the last question. Yes, in terms of uh, access to, for example, medical devices or other type of devices that need to be used daily by the population or medical doctors, one thing that could be done is to move forward from the health and go to the industry, for example, um, and have industry uh, in general producing some of these materials, which actually already happened with COVID in some countries. Excellent. Uh, I fully, fully agree. So, uh, you know, collaboration between the public and private and industry and also uh, universities with, uh, with research as well. So the, the final question um, that I'll ask is, what measures would you recommend to prevent the international spread of the disease? So we're trying to contain it within this initial country, but we also need to stop it from becoming a pandemic. So do we apply strict travel and trade bans? Do we retain opening of all borders to minimize the impact on the economy? Do we impose calibrated travel measures using a risk-based approach, such as temperature screening and testing prior to departure? Uh, use the police and military to force people to comply with lockdown and curfew measures. Uh, ensure international health regulation capacity at points of entry and continuously perform risk assessments, um, or perhaps you have other options. And as people are making their responses, so I can see that most people want to initiate international health regulations. Um, so we're not completely banning travel. We want to use some risk stratification. Um, and I would welcome anyone from the audience to share their 
experience or, or thoughts uh, on how you would do that? The, the lady in the middle. It's more like comments, uh, because, for example, the international health regulations, okay, we have them, but then countries, they can do uh, what they want, uh, even if we have them. So it's, uh, it's very complicated, but that's also why this uh, assessment of the new instrument is so essential and the review of the international health regulations as well. But I also wanted to comment on the risk-based approach. It's important that we have them, have it, and it's not, and that it's not discriminatory, as it was now very recently with Omicron variant, where we had some countries of the European region uh, closing borders with other countries of, of the African region, when those countries of the European region had already reported Omicron cases. So this is very important. Okay, I, f I fully agree with, uh, with the points that, that you're making. And um, in the interest of time, what I will do now is, uh, is hand over uh, to Richard uh, to, to comment on, on this, this final part of the simulation and also to, to provide some, some closing remarks. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Tom. And again, uh, good discussion. And you know, I, I, I think we've had some great uh, insights shared, but. Uh, as you know, we, we don't have a lot of time, so we're really just scratching the surface here. Again, I, I, I think uh, a few things that, that came out of that discussion was, you know, uh, how we reduce the pressure on the health system with a, an escalating outbreak, um, how we prioritize the allocation of uh, limited resources, um, this very important issue of uh, sharing samples, and then what do we do about preventing the international spread? So maybe, again, picking up on, a, on each of these, you know, um, uh, we know that we've got to take steps to protect our frontline healthcare workers. And I think a couple of the points that, were, that, that have been discussed, um, you know, we've all got a responsibility in uh, reducing dis uh, disease transmission. So the public health and social measures that we've heard about, the wearing masks, the social distancing, the avoiding crowds, the ventilation and so on, that can help reduce transmission as well as all the other public health interventions that we've talked about before. Uh, and that can hopefully reduce the pressure on, on the health system, flatten the curve, uh, as you know, we've heard that expression from the earliest days of, uh, of, of the current pandemic. Second thing is that, uh, of course, uh, temporarily suspending non-essential health services has been another way of, um, uh, of taking pressure off the health system. And it's also been a way of reallocating human resources and other resources to respond to the surge of cases. Um, other considerations for you know, prioritizing the allocation of, of resources that may be limited, uh, we've, we've given the example of PPE. And you may recall, early in the pandemic, um, you know, public health institutes like the US CDC were talking about, and, and WHO, we were prioritizing the use of medical masks uh, and the high protection masks, the N95s, uh, the KN95s, to the frontline healthcare workers. We don't want everyone going out there and buying this stuff up. We've got to protect those most at risk. The same applies to valuable um, resources such as the environment that was described, when a vaccine becomes available. We want to prioritize the allocation of those for those most at risk. Of course, um, with COVID, we've had this situation when some of these medical countermeasures have become available to wealthier countries. They've brought them up. Uh, this gets back to the, the big issue of equity. Um, we had a little bit more time with this exercise. We would explore the equity issue in, 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 a, in a bit more detail. Um, I think the, the issue of sharing samples uh, has, uh, has come up a couple of times. Very, very important. Um, and we're developing a broader global system now, global laboratories. Um, you, you may have heard of the, the new bio hub that's being developed uh, in, um, in Switzerland for WHO with the assistance of the, of the Swiss government. You know, there are, and, and through the, uh, uh, the PIP framework, the, uh, the prevention of yeah, uh, the pandemic influenza preparedness framework, we have collaborating centers around the world where samples can be sent um, for identification, uh, for sequencing, and then shared with, uh, with appropriate um, bodies, including the private sector, for the development of medical countermeasures, such as um, vaccines and therapeutics and, and, and diagnostics and so on. So we're trying to get better at, at this sharing, but not only sharing the samples uh, and the materials, 
but also sharing the benefits, making sure that if a country is sharing its samples, that you know that they share in the benefits with uh, and receive the vaccines, receive uh, the, the drugs, receive the diagnostics once they're developed. And then finally, um, preventing international spread. You know, this is a thorny issue. Uh, again, there's never absolute right answers, but I think we've got a little bit more sophisticated about this. Um, you know, as we've mentioned before, the, the blanket travel bans and, and um, uh, travel and trade bans, uh, they, they can be incredibly disruptive and not as effective at controlling disease. So if we have a calibrated approach, this risk-based approach that considers, you know, the epidemiology, the capacities of health systems, um, the, uh, the feasibility within a given sector uh, and so on, then we can apply more targeted uh, control measures such as screening, such as requiring people to be vaccinated, such as quarantining and so on. There are a lot of things that we can do uh, around uh, travel measures, uh, but they have to be calibrated, they have to be evidence-based, and they have to be uh, constantly reviewed. So Tom, you know, just in sort of wrap, wrapping up again, I, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, this has been a really good exercise, uh, I, I think. And uh, although we've only touched on issues, I, I think we've, we've been able to highlight the importance of, of early response, uh, of early investigation, of, of applying those public health measures that we know work uh, to being uh, you know, more judicious on how we apply some of the more blunt instruments, um, the absolutely vital uh, importance of strong leadership in a sectoral collaboration, including uh, the One Health approach, making sure our coordination mechanisms are, are in place and that this is all well sorted out and designed in our and our preparedness plans. The, the vital importance of, of community engagement uh, comes up, up uh, uh, time and time again. And then, you know, some of the, the more exciting uh, developments, the sharing of samples, the development of uh, working with different bodies for the development of the medical countermeasures and so on. And of course, uh, we've touched on the, on the travel and trade issues as well. So have a lot of issues. Uh, not sure we answered uh, every question. Uh, Precisely, but I, I hope uh, I hope you all found this uh, a useful and uh, learning experience, and I, I for one certainly enjoyed it. So thanks, thank you uh, to all the participants. Thank you, Tom, and and, and thank you, uh, Expo, for inviting me to participate. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, I would also like to extend my thanks to Expo 2020 and the WHO EMRO office. I think this has been a very fruitful exercise. Uh, I would encourage you to, to run similar exercises within your departments, organizations, and even universities. Uh, we need to upskill the next generation of public health experts um, with, with the skills required because there are going to be future pandemics. Uh, and I think some of the key points we've touched upon is communication, uh, surveillance, making data-driven decisions, uh, and having a harmonized approach both within uh, and across countries. So with that, I thank you all very much. You've made my uh, job much easier. And I hand back over to uh, Ms. Rewa. Thank you so much. Well, um, the pandemic has revealed something that we didn't expect that the international community or the whole world will be faced with, which is inequality. Inequality in accessing health services in accessing diagnostic tests, treatments, and even in getting the vaccines. As we see anti-vaxxers protesting against getting the vaccine or getting the booster shot, we see other countries where they didn't have even the first shot yet, or only it's the first dose only, and they still didn't, they are not fully vaccinated. They don't have access to vaccine. Another thing is that not having access to the vaccine, it's not only not having the vaccine phys physically in your country, it's not being able to, to reach where you can get the vaccine. And this is a very big challenge many, many countries are facing because people living in remote areas, they cannot access the vaccine and eventually they will not get vaccinated. So I think COVID-19 is a very um, interesting and a very uh, like um, uh, hard uh, teacher for us as humanity 
to reevaluate and rethink equality in health services and in preventive measures. And definitely vaccines is one of them. So let's take a look at Africa and see how did Africa respond to COVID-19. Uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Rhoda Wanyenzi, Dean of uh, Makerere University School of Public Health in Uganda, and she's a primary research partner for Exemplars in Global Health. As well as, I would like to welcome Dr. Donald Kaberuka, Chair of the Global Fund. Good afternoon. We are excited to have you on board today. Thank you. Happy to join the discussion. Thank you. Dr. Wanyenzi, um, can you share with me, based on your uh, extensive research experience, uh, how did uh, different African countries react to uh, the pandemic? Uh, thank you, uh, Riwa, for the opportunity to share our experiences uh, from the exemplars in COVID-19 uh, uh, response in Uganda, in DRC, and uh, Senegal, Nigeria. I will base my comments mainly on the response in the four countries. Uh, these uh, countries uh, all uh, reported their first cases of COVID-19 in March of 2020, about three to four months after the first cases were reported uh, globally. All these countries instituted multi-sectoral coordination structures based on our previous uh, outbreak uh, responses. These are countries that have experienced a lot of other uh, disease emergencies uh, previously. So they built on these structures to mount quickly a multi-sectoral uh, response and also adopted uh, various public health and social measures, uh, especially um, uh, restrictions. And um, uh, the three countries, um, Nigeria, Uganda, and, um, and Senegal, all mounted nationwide uh, lockdowns, with the exception of the uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, which implemented geographical uh, lockdowns based on the most affected regions within the country. Uh, other restrictions also included in-country as well as uh, international travel restrictions and uh, curfews, uh, school closures, uh, limited uh, gatherings, including some of the essential services like outreaches for health uh, services within the community. These were implemented in addition to other measures, including uh, mask mandates, testing, as well as a tracking of contacts, uh, initially institutional quarantines and isolation. But all these uh, eventually gave way uh, when the system got overwhelmed and we moved to uh, home-based isolation as well as uh, quarantine. The testing uh, system also eventually got overwhelmed with challenges of access to uh, testing supplies, limited testers, the slow turnaround, and limited testing has persisted as a challenge, even with the emergence of rapid testing kits, as well as um, repurposing of gene expert machines for additional testing. Notably, interventions to limit the negative effects of the restrictions were severely limited, um, including basics such as access to food and water for the most vulnerable communities. So what did we achieve in terms of uh, control? These countries achieved um, a fairly good control uh, of the pandemic uh, with uh, delayed peaks as well as a shortening of the peaks in terms of the number of cases reported as well as deaths uh, for both the, uh, the first and second waves, uh, including the second that was driven by Delta and the third now with um, uh, Omicron. Although these numbers might have a bit of challenges as well because of the limited testing and surveillance capacity. But this control also came at a cost in terms of negative effects, uh, some of which we have been discussing previously in terms of disruption of other essential services as well as a disruption of other uh, services, including education. And this largely happened because of the very prolonged reliance on restrictions with very limited access to other tools, including uh, vaccinations, including testing to enable us to know who was affected and who was not. 
And I also need to highlight that uh, in DRC and Uganda, notably, we also experienced other epidemics uh, from multiple uh, disease outbreaks, including the more than two-year pandemic, you know, epidemic of Ebola in DRC and other outbreaks in Uganda as well. In fact, in Uganda, we've just been going through a massive polio vaccination uh, because of challenges uh, around uh, issues of vaccination. What about essential health services? We observed um, as, uh, disruptions in many services, disruption of routine vaccinations, for example, a more than 30% disruption of DBT vaccination across countries, and uh, also limited uh, antenatal care, as well as uh, uh, deliveries uh, for mothers at facilities. And this was associated with increased maternal mortality. The, the recovery of these services also varied across um, countries. For example, in Uganda, the disruptions for DPT, um, uh, we realized a recovery within about two months, while in um, Nigeria, it took about five months to recover, and Senegal had not even recovered uh, by end of uh, 2020. We also recognized uh, disruptions that were quite varied across districts, across uh, regions within these countries. For example, in Uganda, the increased maternal mortality was driven by largely one district, which had severe health system challenges that preceded the COVID uh, pandemic. And we also did observe similar variations across other indicators in terms of essential health service um, uh, disruptions. The challenges that created this were uh, largely uh, the supply side, but also on the demand side. For example, on the supply side, we had uh, severe um, uh, limitations in terms of staffing, and some of these predated um, the pandemic. There were also transport challenges for health workers because of the transport restrictions for health workers that did not have personal vehicles. They had challenges reaching health facilities. There was also fears of uh, acquiring COVID and actual COVID infections among health workers, with many of them um, you know, staying at home due to sickness. And then medical supplies were disrupted, including uh, basic supplies for other care, as well as personal protective um, equipment. Then we also had issues with the repurposing of uh, health service space for COVID isolation, repurposing of health workers towards uh, COVID-19 response, as well as reallocation of funding from other disease programs to COVID-19. And yet we had very limited allocation of funding to maintenance of essential health services. On the other hand, the communities also suffered the effects of restrictions in transportation, and uh, uh, especially coupled with poor ambulance services for emergency care, as well as fears of acquiring uh, infections within the health facilities. This uh, might partly explain some of the challenges that we faced, especially among the most uh, vulnerable individuals that could not afford to hire uh, services uh, as such as vehicles. On the other hand, we see a lot of variations across these countries, largely because of the policies as well as interventions that were implemented to ensure maintenance of essential health services. For example, in Uganda, we had um, uh, an establishment of a committee that was focusing solely on maintenance of essential health services in March 2020. There was development of guidelines and training of health workers, as well as support for health workers to ensure adaptation of health services and ensure maintenance of the most critical services. This, on the other hand, was slower uh, in some of the other countries. And we did not necessarily initially have dedicated uh, committees to track this as well as guidelines. The other issue that I need to highlight is um, there was also a focus on analysis of data to detect and respond to disruptions quickly. And this started especially earlier in Uganda compared to other services, although the data itself had challenges in terms of uh, quality and needed a lot more um, a focus to improve um, the quality. Other services beyond health were also severely affected, most notably education with very prolonged um, closures of schools and also livelihood. And unfortunately, we had very limited interventions uh, to counter some of these um, 
uh, challenges. Some of the service delivery adaptations that I can share include uh, reduced contact with facilities and um, um, uh, innovations including multi-month uh, drug refills uh, for those in chronic care, but also using telemedicine and using community groups, uh, including community health workers, the patients themselves, uh, and other chronic care clients also stepped in to support delivery of drugs to some of their uh, colleagues. So this enhanced use of community systems as well as partnerships with the private sector and using communities themselves helped to step in and improve um, uh, service uh, maintenance. There was also recruitment of additional health workers in facilities, especially for the cadres, where we had uh, very few um, uh, workers like the critical care as well as uh, procurement and improved uh, supply of protective wear in partnership with the private sector. I would say that uh, in conclusion, uh, whereas our countries achieved control of COVID, we had a lot of challenges with uh, disruptions of other services. Some of these were short-lived and some of these uh, we still continue to face. And then also the disruption of other essential services, especially uh, education. And because of this, I would recommend that future pandemic efforts should all focus on strategies to mitigate negative effects, but especially to make sure that we access in an equitable manner the biomedical interventions, the diagnostics, vaccinations, as well as therapeutics, so that we can reduce the over-reliance on restrictions that have very severe effects. This should also be coupled with policies upfront uh, to ensure maintenance of essential health services and guide providers on interventions to limit disruptions. But we should also invest in data and analytics, both at national and subnational levels, so that we can quickly detect and address, as well as monitor, uh, the progress in terms of not only pandemic control, but also maintenance of essential health services. The services as well as interventions should also be equitable and there should be interventions to mitigate the effects, especially on the most vulnerable populations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roda, for this comprehensive overview. Dr. Donald Kabruka, I am so excited to have you with us today on board. Uh, can you please share with us uh, how the Global Fund contributed to uh, the response to COVID-19 in Africa? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thank you, moderator. Thank you, Rhoda, for what you have just said. I really appreciate this opportunity, and thank you all for allowing me to participate. In my double capacity as chair of the Global Fund for AIDS, Malaria, and tuberculosis, but also one of the envoys of the African Union on the COVID uh, response. So I want to begin by thanking His Majesty, uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, uh, for his graciousness and for the way he has organized this expo and provided this opportunity for this conversation. Equally to Minister Rim El Hashim for his exemplary chair of the expo in the way it gives us an opportunity for this uh, exchange. Uh, UAE has been a big supporter of the Global Fund, uh, so that everyone knows, including a very large $50 million contribution at the last uh, replenishment. And we look forward to working with you uh, in our next level of effort, uh, which will be chaired by the President of the United States. So I have a couple of points to make, uh, colleagues. Number one, the Global Fund although it is a global fund for AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis, was probably the first responder to COVID, at least as far as Africa is concerned, providing financial support for uh, diagnostics, therapeutics, and reinforcing health systems, building on what we had already built over the last 20 years for the old pandemics. Why is this important? As we speak about COVID, uh, and other pandemics to come, we should not forget that we've got old pandemics which are killing many more people than even COVID. 
We still have got 500,000 children in low-income countries dying of malaria today. That is much more than COVID. And therefore, we cannot separate dealing with old pandemics and new pandemics that there is to come. We need to have a package which handles all those together. And that is why the Global Fund decided from very early on that to secure our achievements of the last 20 years, we have to invest in uh, dealing with COVID because it was a danger to the old pandemics, which are still killing many more people than even COVID itself. I really hope, uh, as we discuss this, uh, colleagues, we understand this issue. Uh, it's through the age, malaria, and tuberculosis, uh, the killing more people, they're still largely, they are largely now a problem for the global south, not a problem for wealthy countries. And therefore, the attention, the bandwidth in dealing with them gets narrower as we deal with new pandemics. This is a huge risk for the achievements of the last 25 years. And I would like to put this on the table. Second point I want to make is that Rhoda just described the, all the issues, the responses of the African countries, the measures taken, the trade-offs. As we have put it, it was a trade-off between lives and livelihoods. So damage to the economies, including the first recession in Africa in 30 years. But lives had to be saved. So what do we learn from this synchronized recession? Poverty has deepened. Inequalities have widened. And even more, we can now see a clear link between health financing and our economies. And therefore, the first lesson we have learned here in Africa is A, we need to absolutely increase our level of health financing and the quality of health financing. Partly because international solidarity, international support in terms of crisis has shown its limitations. The second thing, we're volunteers. I believe even in wealthy countries, is the importance of social safety nets, making sure that no one is left behind in terms of crisis. From wealthy countries to poor countries to middle income countries, this has shown its limitations. And therefore, we have got deepening poverty and widening inequality because our social safety nets were not fit for purpose. And thirdly, the issue of equity. Science was able to provide quickly some of the solutions to COVID, but the benefits of this science was available only to some countries and not others. And therefore, as we design the future uh, for preparedness, we need to think about preparedness with equity, equity to knowledge, equity to what makes all of us safe, equity in terms of counter cyclical support. Equity in terms of not having these disorganized travel bans, which simply worsen, deepen the problems in the global uh, supply chains. I want to end by saying the following also. That here in Africa, something has happened which is unique, which has been fantastic. That is the way the African Union was prepared to deal with this crisis. From very early on, the African Union chairperson, President oh, Ramaphosa oh, of South Africa, decided to put in place a group of uh, experts, including your modest uh, servant, to try to mobilize international support and look around this problem. And one of the things which have happened is the fact that Africa got organized and to strengthen the Africa Center for Disease Control. Everybody now agrees that the Africa Center for Disease Control is among those who are first in class globally. We will have to strengthen this 
going forward. The second one was the African platform for acquisition of supplies. Because at the beginning, it was very difficult for many of our countries, even those with money, to get access to diagnostic tools, to therapeutics, uh, let alone to vaccines, which everyone has spoken about. And so a platform was in put in place, which even the Caribbean countries have used to try to access uh, these uh, uh, commodities. The third one is establishment of the African Medicine Agency for regulatory purposes. And of course, the push for the manufacturing of vaccines in Africa. Because it clearly, it's obvious. That in future pandemics, there have to be a way in which a whole continent of a one billion people can be simply entirely dependent on what is available globally. And so I want to end by saying, this crisis has demonstrated a couple of things for all of us, that the global community, the global architecture was ill-equipped for the pandemic. And I welcome all the proposals on the table for, for the future. But those can only be effective if they're also equitable, equitable in terms of access to everyone on the planet. Because as everyone says nowadays, no one is safe until everybody is safe. And therefore we have to figure out a form of preparedness which is effective, but also equitable. And thirdly, we have to rethink global solidarity. It cannot be that global solidarity is okay in normal times, but in terms of a crisis, it is everybody for themselves. This is what caused the Great Recession in the 1920s and 30s, at least the global financial problem in terms of what the economies call bigger than neighbors. When currency manipulation, trade manipulation simply made all of us poorer. It is very important that we have got a form of preparedness which is effective but also equitable. And I want to assure you that uh, the Global Fund, the Global Fund will be uh, part and parcel of that response. I thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Donald. Thank you, Dr. Roda, for the, uh, the uh, comprehensive and interesting facts you have shared with us, the actual facts you have shared with us. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you. What about the future? So far, vaccines have proved to be the cornerstone in preventing the spread of any infection. So are we really investing well in vaccines in terms of research, in terms of manufacturing, production, in terms of dissemination, in terms of community education? So we really need to focus more on the vaccines and the vaccination strategies that needs to be tailored around these components to develop and to provide better vaccination and better prevention to communities. I would like to uh, welcome uh, the speech uh, will be presented by Dr. Seth Berkeley, the executive director of the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. We're going to listen to his speech now. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to join you today for this important and highly topical issue. COVID-19 has already cost us 5.5 million lives globally and the global economy as much as $12 trillion. Yet nearly two years since the pandemic was declared, not only is it an ongoing threat, but we are ill-prepared for the next pandemic. During any pandemic, a rapid global response is absolutely critical. Through COVAX, the vaccine pillar of Act A, we have delivered more than a billion vaccine doses to people in 144 economies in less than a year, making it a true multilateral global solution to this pandemic. It is the largest and most complex global rollout in history. 
Over 90% of these doses are distributed to people in the 92 lower income countries supported by the Gavi COVAX advanced market commitment. In a globalized world such as ours, this is essential because until people in all corners of the world are protected, this virus will continue to circulate and new and potentially more dangerous variants will emerge. No one is safe until everyone is safe. Co-led by Gavi, CEPI, WHO, and UNICEF, COVAX is the only global mechanism striving towards equitable access, and it has proven that it can deliver. But we have faced many obstacles along the way. A lack of early at-risk funding, vaccine hoarding, export restrictions, and delays in scaling up manufacturing have led to delays in equitable access. During a pandemic, when it comes to vaccines, diagnostics, and therapeutics, we cannot afford such delays. Today, with more than 3 billion people still unvaccinated, the majority in lower income countries, we need to accelerate the global effort. This month, we launched the Gavi COVAX AMC 2022 investment opportunity, calling on leaders from public and private sectors to renew their support and help raise at least $5.2 billion in additional funds over the next three months. This will help COVAX create a pandemic vaccine pool, a buffer to protect its supply in the face of future bottlenecks and meet the emerging needs of countries. Without this additional support, we risk further delays in accessing and securing supplies and helping countries deliver vaccines into arms all across the world. And that is ultimately what it will take to stifle this virus. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seth. Now it's my pleasure to invite on screen Dr. Rebecca Martin. She's the Vice President for Global Health, Emory University and former CDC Director. Welcome, Dr. Rebecca. We are excited to have you today. Thank you, Rewa. And I want to thank the organizers for this important exchange today as part of the Health um, and Wellness Week of Expo 2022. I believe you're going, sorry, I believe you're going to talk more about the the role of vaccines in preventing the spread of infections and in beating pandemics. Yes, that is correct. So the floor is yours. Thank you. My apologies for jumping. (laughs) (laughs) I I want to begin by stating that we need to plan now to be prepared for the next pandemic. We need to learn from and address the gaps and barriers that we have identified and are facing today. Forming the interdisciplinary partnerships and collaborations that are essential in preparing and responding and creating the resilient systems and the quality workforce that can be scaled to surge when we need it. As we have witnessed from the emergence of pandemics over time, and now are experiencing now with SARS-CoV-2, both preparedness and response to control them requires collaboration. And we've heard this from all of the esteemed panelists this morning. This comes from within a community, across borders and globally. Vaccines are a critical medical countermeasure as part of a multifaceted response to prevent transmission and save lives. Together with the treatment of infected individuals, detecting and diagnosing the disease, as we've heard today from speakers, the importance of isolation, potential quarantining, and public health safety measures. However, vaccines may not yet exist to respond to a new pandemic disease, as was the case with SARS-CoV-2, or vaccines that do exist may not have the effectiveness needed to protect populations, as is the case with pandemic flu over the years, every time the vaccine has to be changed. Therefore, the importance of through ongoing innovation, emergency development and production of new vaccines in large supply, together with scalable, far-reaching deployment strategies are required to get vaccines to at-risk populations. 
across continents, private and public sector must work together to produce and deploy vaccines rapidly. And as we've heard the importance and value of the equitable strategy. We, this is the third time you'll hear that no one is safe until everyone is safe. And this has never been truer. I wanna to touch on five key factors related to vaccines and their use in pandemics and the need for them going forward in the future. First, from the eradication of smallpox to current initiatives to eliminate measles and malaria, to eradicate polio, and now to control the COVID-19 pandemic, vaccines are a cornerstone. In all of these initiatives, science is a necessary pillar. Learning from implementation of the initiatives and innovating as required, the science drives the program and also the measures that we can take through vaccines for new vaccines, diagnostics, and also treatments. Secondly, innovation must also be a key pillar in preparing for the future. Establishing or enhancing vaccine manufacturing capacity around the globe, not only in a few geographic locations, but all over and sharing of that knowledge is essential. To deliver vaccines, there must be effective and well-designed vaccination strategies. And this is my third point here, from logistics, to supply chain resources, the quality workforce to deliver and well-honed communications as we've heard about this during the session today. We need this to prevent disease and control spread. And we can learn from current initiatives as we've heard from polio eradication, malaria, measles, and meningitis as well in the campaigns that are conducted among children, but also in adolescents and adults and how we reach them with safe vaccines. Vaccine deployment must be flexible enough to adapt to the unique situations of particular pandemic. But in addition, we've learned from past and current experience, both in the normal everyday and crisis context that demonstrates that getting vaccine into the arms of those at risk is more complicated than simply making the vaccine available. We've seen this in the initiatives to eradicate, eliminate diseases, COVID-19, as well as the Ebola outbreaks that were previously mentioned. We know from these initiatives that innovative technologies and collaborative strategies are essential pillars of successful uh, nationwide and global vaccination campaigns. Fourth, importance is in order for people to get vaccinated and to develop the widespread acceptance of vaccines, we must enhance pandemic vaccine awareness, access to vaccines and acceptance of vaccines. So once we've recapped in terms of the need for innovation, for science, the development and manufacturing of vaccine, a strategy to deploy vaccines, we have to ensure a high level demand and uptake of a vaccine. And that requires constant and effective communications with communities about the science behind how vaccines are made, the risk of the disease and the benefit of the vaccine. It also requires addressing myths and disinformation rapidly to build and sustain the trust that is needed so that vaccines can be delivered and save lives during pandemics. In conclusion, we must come together now and work to prepare for the next pandemic. As we've heard today about political will, the best science, resilient systems, quality strategies and community engagement are all necessary. And we must have the tools for the future to be able to protect our populations. And that is through the use of vaccines and then developing and making sure that we have that capacity everywhere around the world. We know that COVID-19 has served as a powerful catalyst for better collaboration around the world and has also obligated us to address health equity everywhere. Innovations to prevent future outbreaks, especially in vaccine development, are crucial to maintaining the health and well-being of populations around the world. Thank you so much for your attention today, and I appreciate the time, and if there's time for questions, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Martin. 
as you said, we are all in this together and no one is safe until we are all safe. Thank you so much. Thank you. As we reach the end of our event, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Dr. Juan Carlson, Senior Advisor and former Director General at the Public Health Agency of Sweden to deliver the closing remarks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank the organizers for a very, very inspiring seminar this afternoon. Um, when I went to medical school, uh, which was uh, 40 years ago, um, no, none of the, the pathogens we are dealing with today were either discovered or not regarding as being uh, important or problematic. We know that what, what we've experienced in the last 40 years is emerging diseases, new pathogens or old ones in new forms. And still we are being surprised everything that is happening. Why is this? Why, why are we taken by surprise every outbreak almost? I will argue that... Um, Modern medicine today is a response system. It's, uh, it's a response system. It's not a system for prevention or almost no preparedness. We're responding to, to new events just as if we have no recollection about history. And that's one of the problematic areas. We've heard today, I think there was an ex the excellent... Uh, lectures and the, the uh, interactive uh, workshop on response. We need to learn more about response. What is the basic of response? What is the fundamental of response? Another important issue addressed today is equity. Should we be surprised by inequity? No. We know that all diseases are, are um, hitting us in an unequal way. From tobacco, diabetes, all, almost all communicable diseases. So this was expected. There are differences between countries, but also in countries. In one of the richest countries uh, where I represent in Sweden, we see these inequities uh, in the pandemic as well. When it comes to morbidity and mortality, the COVID-19 hit lower socioeconomic groups, immigrants, etc., much, much harder than the rest of the population. And what does this tell us? It tells us that we need to create a response system that take the equity questions into account. We have started uh, along that road by uh, the global cooperation. But more is needed, really. I'm not quite sure that we will be able to do this all over again. Uh, the lockdowns, the vaccination campaigns, etc., um, this was more of a miracle, I would say, to have a vaccine in one year. Nobody expected that. Would that happen next time? Probably not. It will take longer time. We must be, we must be much better prepared. We, we must think about what will be the accurate response measures to take. And I'll, I'll doubt that lockdowns, as we know them today, will be a... a a possible way of going in all countries. We have a lot of opposition against this. We need to be better prepared, but, and that's my point, we need to invest in prevention. Prevention, as we heard by the first speakers here, uh, Professor Cunningham and uh, Dr. Vera and others, uh, when it comes to zoonosis, is prevent zoonosis to happen, prevent the the viruses to move from animals into humans. We know how this could be done. It's just it's, there's no funding for it. 
it was said it will cost 10 to 20 billion dollars. That's, no, that's nothing. We know that we talk about animal welfare, but we also talk about human welfare, we talk about deforestation, we talk about uh, first responders being down the lowest on the scale. This is investments that we need to do in order to prevent these things to happen. We cannot rely on, on a quick vaccine production. We cannot rely on a global response as, we, as we've been doing, especially if, if diseases are not affecting the rich part of the world, to be frank. Diseases only affecting uh, parts of the world with less economic power are not being addressed as COVID-19, believe me. So my, my last comment is that this is a matter of sustainability, very much. We'd be talking about the Agenda 2030, about the sustainable goals. To, to invest in prevention is also in investing in equity. Invest in technical prevention and know how, how to prevent zoonosis, but also to invest in, in those people most likely to be affected by these diseases. To invest in health uh, literacy in people, to invest in knowledge. Not only tell people what to do, but explain to the people why they need to do these things. I think that's an investment for the future. And I'm rather optimistic. I think the, I think the, the world has learned a lesson during the past two years. These investments are necessary and they need to come now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kwan Carlson. Well, as our session today comes to an end, I would like to thank you all for your uh, presence and for your uh, engagement and interaction. And I would like to thank all the speakers, whether uh, they were present in person with us or virtually, for their very insightful, comprehensive, and informative presentations. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the session. I hope you did as well. Thank you for being with us, and be well and be happy. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>